Hi, uh, my name is Mike Rogers. I'm with the Church of Newburn, and I am here with Ian McCormick. Ian uh, is on the senior leadership team of uh, Kingsgate Church in downtown London, mid London. Ian also, which I'm sure you've heard, has a powerful testimony of 1982 when he died. He um, actually died, went to heaven, came back. Ian's been sharing his testimony for years, uh, impacting so many people. It's been so powerful. His testimony is out there, but um, in our conversations with Ian, with Ian's church at Kingsgate and here at the ch church of New Bern, it's almost like an experiment that we're doing on really trying to redefine what a New Testament church looks like with a five-fold ministry and things like that. And uh, Ian, hi. How's it going? Great to be here. Ah, oh, thank Love you. Love your church. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, what's happened at Kingsgate Church and what's the Lord showing you there? I think years ago, um, when I've been saved since 1982, I think I've been in every type of church and, and ministers and I was questioning the Lord when I got saved. I said, Lord, what is the church? And he was speaking to me out of Ephesians 4, um, 11 to 13, how Jesus has given people, apostles, prophets, the gifts, the people gifts, to, to build the church, to equip it, to bring it to maturity and full stature in Christ. And I could hear in those years people talking about equipping and training and releasing people into ministry. And I said, well, I could see the ministry gifts. I could see people moving in prophecy and, and, and words of knowledge and gifts of healings and miracles gifts of tongues, interpretation of tongues. So I saw the gifts of the Spirit. And then I could, I was having difficulty trying to understand the offices of the people gifts of the apostles and prophets. And, and so for many years I'd travel around and at different times I'd be in churches where you'd have a senior pastor. Mm -hmm. And I'd find perhaps, although they, everyone was a pastor, and I was thinking, but they're not God. That guy's a teacher. And this is a church folks around teaching. Then I'd go to another church and the the senior pastor would be an evangelist. Um, some of them may be prophets. And I was thinking, why have we got it so separated? Why, why is there different groups? And, and why are they gathering around just one of the fivefold? Why don't we have one that's all in the same place at the same time, like the once top shop? Yeah. And, um, so I began to question and, and ask the Lord about that and he took me on staff in a church because I was saying, God, I want a fivefold church, I want to be in a church that actually has that. And I went on church, in a, um, a 5,000 member church and a plant hundred churches, went on staff there and I could see that the senior leader of that church was an apostle. And then I could see there were prophets and they had 300 uh, home groups so I could see there was pastoral care. They had teaching from uh, navigators through the doctor, the doctor of Divinity, so they had teaching. And um, they had a 24-7 prayer room. And I said, this seems to be all in one place. Yeah. I said, but it seems to me is that the person who's running it is the apostle. And the others have been given responsibility in their areas, but all the authority has gone back to the one person. Mm -hmm. So it's like they've been given responsibility without authority. And it seems still pyramid structure where the apostles are at the top of the pile. Yeah. And although they had a great servant heart, I still thought, well, we've now, at least we've got the other officers operating in the same place at the same time. When, um, you know, we're, uh, people have said this is an apostolic age of the church, where yes. the apostles are being restored. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've heard people say, uh, you can throw a rock and hit eight to, eight to ten apostles in any congregation now as a joke. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everyone, there's a lot of people calling themselves apostles. Yep. What is your, uh, when you define someone as an apostle, or, what are your thoughts about that? Okay, well, if you, the first thing I think is to discover the, the other four. Okay. So if you look at your hand, you've got five. Yeah. <laughs> so the prophet is like the, the point, you know, the finger. That, Thus says the Lord, and the prophets are very much open heaven, angels, revelation, uh, throne room, supernatural encounters, dreams and visions, transformation, glory around, and spiritual warfare, and, and very much you can see the office of the prophet, particularly 
how they operate and how they function. Mm -hmm. The evangelist is very much souls at any cost and they're very much into seeing people saved and healings taking place and their whole heart drive is almost like tunnel vision. We just want to see people born again. We want to see people come into the kingdom and find Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then you find the pastor, his heart, the father heart, wants to counsel, wants to heal the broken hearts. Very much the compassion and the shepherd's heart of, 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 of the pastor. Yeah. The teacher, usually not that great at pastoring, not, can teach about evangelism but can't get anyone saved. Mm -hmm. And prophetic, I think they can teach about it, but they mostly aren't actually prophetic. You know, I've been under really what I would call the office of a teacher, and these yeah. guys can break the word down. Okay. In a way, it's like it's, it's, it's like you're sitting there and you're served up a T-bone steak, yeah, right. and you're just cutting into it. And the teacher has that anointing, and they're bringing revelation. Like no one else. And they're often reading four or five books. You walk into their house and they've got a library of books, and they're already reading. And they're they're able to bring the word. They're not great necessarily people, people, but people person like the pastor, but yeah. they can really connect in the area of understanding principles and, and often give three or five points that would help the person come to know the Lord through the Word. Okay. And so what I found was that we tend to, in the body of Christ, birds feather the flock together. So then I'd find the school of the teachers and we'd have Bible Teacher schools. schools. Teacher yes. schools. Then we'd have the school of the evangelists, the evangelistic school. Then we'd have the school of the prophets, the prophet school. And then we'd have the school of the pastor, the poor guys running the church with no one there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, he's having to look after them and they've got these different schools all camped around one of the offices of the fivefold. And I said, Lord, I've been around almost all of them. Why isn't it that they aren't working together? And he said, well, the problem is that if you try and get a teacher to connect with a prophet, you try and do that on your hand, it's, it's a bit painful. So the prophet's going, well, I saw revelation of this, I heard this, and the teacher says, where's that in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And so they can, have, they can have difficulty working yes. together. The pastoral evangelists tend to work reasonably well together, because they're side by side. Yes. The teacher and the evangelist can have issues at times. <laughs> and so I said, well, what, well, what can connect them all? He said, the apostle is like the jack of all trades and the master of none. The apostle can prophesy, evangelize, pastor and teach. Yeah. So it's almost like a chameleon, like Joseph's multicolored coat, can literally move, so the apostle can move into the prophetic camp and they go, well, isn't he a prophet? He can move in the evangelistic camp and say, isn't he an evangelist? Move into the pastoral camp, he knows the Father, heart of God. So I said, God, what is that? He said, the job of the apostle is to literally connect with each one of them, to bring them together into unity. You know, Jesus was often called a good teacher. Yet he was a teacher that moved in power and signs and wonder. So, Wonders, and I think teachers should. I well, think all the officers should. Well, I think Jesus, as we find, is that he's the fullness of the fivefold. He yes. is the apostle. He says he's the apostle of our yeah. He is the spirit of prophecy, revelations. He is the evangelist who goes looking for the lost sheep. He's the shepherd who looks for them. He is the pastor. He, he looks after the, the, the hearts. Of, of broken hearts. He also, of course, is the teacher. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is actually the fullness of all the fivefold because everything is within him. He is the head of the church. And I think Jesus was very smart to make sure he didn't give one of those, give all of those gifts to one person. Otherwise, we have little Jesus running around. Yes. So Jesus actually gave some apostles, some prophets. So of who he is, because he said he is the head. He is all the offices, all the gifts, yes. all, everything comes from him. You know, um, so we reflect parts of that. So the job is when you give someone the office of a prophet, one of the greatest mysteries they've got to find out is to find out where the other part of the puzzle, it's like in a, a big puzzle, Yeah. where are the other parts of the puzzle so that we can actually present the fullness of who Jesus is. Because if we only reflect part of who he is, as a prophet or a teacher, we must then be in relationship and connection with the others in order to the fullness of Christ to be reflected. And that's not just the, Rome, the Ephesians 4, Romans 12 talks about ministry of hospitality, helps, mercy, compassion. And what I've found is that when I travel around the body of Christ, I'd find people who are mercy ministry people that work with administrators and set up refugee camps, and feed the hungry, um, orphanages, because these guys are too busy fighting amongst themselves and the church. And they said, 
why, why waste my time waiting for these pastors and leaders and apostles to get their heads sorted? Let's just do the stuff and look after them by, and do some mercy. Let's feed the hungry. Let us have set up some food banks. Let us set up some orphanages. And I said, God, how does that work? He said, the Ephesians 4 and the Romans 12 are supposed to work together. Mm-hmm. They're all supposed to be working together because they all reflect part of who I am. So it's a one-stop shop. Most of us in the church have got like the, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the, but the corporate world goes, you need a one-stop shop, the Walmart. We're, we're so far, if someone gets saved, well, they get saved in the street by some evangelist, well, then they're going to try and find someone who's going to teach them. Then after they've been in church for a while, they think, well, I need deliverance. They're going to go off to someone who's going to deliver. Yeah. Then they think, well, I want to go into heaven and to the glory realm. So then they need to go to this other group. And by the time they've traveled around, they've been in about five different groups and everyone's trying to hold on to them. So, you, you know, you just come under authority and <laughs> the poor sheep are floating around trying to find out how do I get equipped, trained and come to the fullness of Christ because none of these leaders are in the same place. I can remember, um, it was, a, it was a, several years ago where I had the question posed on the inside of me, is there room in a local church for all five? Yeah. And it, I, I, mean, I didn't know at the time, so I was really... Search and I came to the conclusion years ago, yes. Of course, because that means Jesus. That way. Well, if they aren't there, then part of Jesus ain't there. It's simple as that. And, and he wrote to the Ephesus church, wrote to the Corinth church, and they said that it's supposed to be there. But we get this teaching, oh, well, there's the universal church and then there's the local church. Well, I don't see that. Ecclesia doesn't separate that out. We do. In fact, I believe every local church, every church has, and mostly within their midst, the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, teacher, pastor, the ministry of administration, healing, works of helps, they're there. Yes. You know, I've, um, we chase them out so they go and form their own groups. I've uh, looked at it this way. If you have a prophet in the church, yeah. the role of that prophet is not to do all of the prophesying but it's to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. They come under and there's an anointing, there's a grace upon them to help release that gift of prophecy throughout the church. An evangelist, teacher, it's the same thing. Dead right, but before they can equip, they first have to be in unity with the other four. Yes. yes. So that we can jump we can jump the gate, jump the thing and say, oh, well, the job of the prophet is to equip. So then what happens if they aren't able to, or we don't have the revelation of how they can all work in the same church, we then push them out so they form the school of the prophets and equip and train outside of it. Or we push them out to the school of the evangelists and they equip and train. Yeah. So what ends up happening is that we get into the equipping and training rather than just doing it, which is true, because you have to be able to do it before you can equip and train. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's a, there's a balance in that. And so you have to grow in your own maturity as a prophet or an evangelist, as a pastor or teacher. You actually have to be a Timothy under a Paul. You have to learn how to do the stuff. The danger is if you're not allowed to do the stuff in the house, you get pushed out of the house and get called a parachurch or a para group. The trouble is the church itself is mostly paraplegic because yes. they're missing. And I said to God, what does the church look like? He said, wipe all the thing you've ever had been brought up in an Episcopalian church. He said, get rid of the building, the, the, the robes, the whole deal, get rid of the lot. I'm going to show you. And I said, well, okay, help me. He said, the church is a bride, mm-hmm. a building, and a body. I said, my gosh, the teacher would love that. Three Bs, you know, yeah. three point seven. <laughs> bride, he speaks about intimacy, marriage, and preparing. The mystery of the bride is in Genesis. The mystery of the bride is in Revelation. So it's all to do with being waiting, preparing our heart as a pure, holy virgin for Christ to be one with them. Yes. So it's intimacy. It's marriage. It's relationship. He said, so that's what the bride speaks about. It's us intimately in relation and love and with him. Mm-hmm. First love. Yeah. Greatest commandments love God with all your heart. So the bride is the most important. He said, but then you have the body. He said, the body speaks about function and the building speaks about structure. Mm-hmm. So intimacy, no? function and structure. And I said, okay, God, building, show me. You gotta show me. He said, Ian, we're living stones and we're built together. So that means individuals are living stones. I said, I've got that. He said, I'm the master architect, not the grand architect of the universe. He said, as we're to build, uh-huh. and Paul talks about that, we need to build with him, with his plan. Yeah. And I said, okay, a building. I've worked on building sites, I've farmed, I've, we've built sheds, we've built houses. Help me with the building. He said, Ian, 
the first thing you need to do is to find the cornerstone. And the Bible says Jesus is the cornerstone of the building. Yeah. And then he said the next thing, of course, are the foundation stones. The first thing the builder does, he gets the cornerstone, runs the plumb lines out, and then puts in foundation stones, the foundation of the building. He said Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19 from memory, it says the foundation stones are the apostles and the prophets. Mm -hmm. So they are the ones that everything it's laid upon. It's laid upon. Yeah. It's that it takes the weight. Which but the foundation isn't just the cornerstone. Many people said, oh, me and Jesus, this is the church, or we're two or more agree as the church. Jesus said, no, 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 that's about your relationship with me. That's talking about intimacy, the bride, and being married to me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. He said, the building talks about structure, which is the church. So you firstly have a cornerstone, which is not a building. Then you put down the foundation stones, which is not a building. It's the laying the key part, which is the apostles and prophets. He said the next thing that they do, and if you look in, in Corinthians, it says first apostles, second prophets, then the next thing is teachers. He said then they put a bottom plate and frame it. I said, no, I've been on site school, we do that, we frame, word, yeah. frame it. He said that's the teacher. Apostles, prophets, teacher, frame it. Mm -hmm. He said then what's the next thing that goes on the building? I said, well, the roof. He said the roof, the pass of the covering. He said then what happens is that then you board it up. Remember, you, bought, you, you get in and drywall it. He said, or he put stones to determine what material you're working with. We're not to work with hay straw and stuff. We're supposed to work yeah. with gold, silver, and precious stones. This is the house of his glory. And so he then said the evangelist is the person who brings in the lost to be part of the house. And then I said, how do the Romans 12 work? Ministry of Hospitality Administration said, then you've got to wire that house up. You've got to put furniture in it. You've got to put curtains. So you make it from a house into a home. So working together, it's a living house, it's a living building, fitted together jointly, making up all the fivefold. So he said, there's structure to the church. I said to the Lord, what does the building of the church look like right now? <laughs> Instantly, I saw an industrial yard. And as I looked, I could see a roof on the ground. Just off the ground, it was like it was leaning up against, on one corner, against a rock. Mm -hmm. I said, what's that? He said, the rock represents me, the cornerstone, and the roof represents the pastor. I watch people walk up, lift up the roof, climb underneath it, and then watch the roof come down. I thought to myself, what's that? He said, that's people coming under a pastoral covering of a church where only in the church is a pastor. pastor yes. I thought, well, how low will you go? There must be very little light coming in there, but they at least have some shelter and covering. He said, that's the roof on the ground and people coming under the covering of a one-man church, the local pastor, the vicar, the priest, whatever you call them. Mm -hmm. I then swung on my left, and I thought, that's an interesting thing of what the church looks like right now, a whole bunch of roofs on the ground, but they will, when you ask them, they'll say that their ministry is based upon Christ, which is true. Then I swung my head to the left, and I saw... Um, concrete with steel rebar rods coming up, grass around it, and I'm looking at that and going, that's the foundation of a building, but there's no building on it. You know how you can sometimes drive down the road and think someone started construction, mm -hmm. and then they never finish it. It's like it's been abandoned. I said, what on earth is that? He said, that's the apostles and prophets who, who are very, barely visible. They've gone so deep into the core of who I am that when you look at them, you can hardly see anything of any significance because there's no structure to physically look at. They've spent their entire time trying to go into the foundation and the core because if you don't get the foundations right and go deep into the heart of God because deep calls under deep, you miss the actual understanding of who God is. Because that you might have buildings, but if you don't have foundations, you're in serious trouble. Yes. Yes. And he said, no one wants to work with the apostles and prophets. Then I swung my eyes between the roof on the ground and, and the foundations and in the distance I saw a man standing on a rock preaching his heart out, a young man with maybe 200 people in this field listening to him. I said, well, what's that? He said, that's the evangelist having an open air. <laughs> oh my, crusade, open air, exactly what I've seen. I've seen, and I've done it myself, I've gone onto the streets, getting people saved, and where the heck are you going to bring them? Yes. And then if you do bring them, they're like orphans, because if you're not connected to the house, they don't even have a relationship with you for you to actually bring them in to disciple them. And the evangelist says, well, that's not my job. I don't need to pass them. I've just got to save them. We've done uh, crusades and 
DR in the Dominican Republic, but what I did first was establish a strong relationship with a pastor mm -hmm. I trusted. And his team would come in, and they would set up home groups, and mm -hmm. so I would do the crusade. Oh yeah, but home but that's all. That's the assuming that the church that you brought them into has the fivefold, which yes. I haven't seen. So you must have got a pastor, teacher, yeah, and a youth evangelist with you. So you've got two of the fivefold. So they are picking up the crumbs of whatever you're doing out there, and we say, well, we're not just working alone in the street. I've been in the done that too. Yeah. So we've done the whole deal with home church, local church, uh -huh. and we've tried to justify why we're doing it and how that's. So anyway, I'm just going, okay, God, I've been there and done that, and I've seen a mixture of all the pack of cards. So I swung my head to the right, and here was the house. Roof, windows, door, hundreds of people going into this house. And I said, that must be the church. Can I go into the vision? Can I go into the house? He said, yes. So I stepped into the vision, went straight into the house, and as I walked in, I saw a pack of people, hands up into there, worshipping God, and as I begin to lift my hands up to worship the Lord, the Lord said, do not look up here and look down. I went, what? He said, look down. So I looked down. He said, what do you see? I said, I see earth, dirt. I'm standing on dirt. He said, what's in this house? He said, look carefully. I said, well, we've got people in here. The evangelist has brought them in. We've got a roof, so we've got a pastor. We've got wall, so we've got a teacher. We've got three of the fivefold. He said, look carefully. I looked in the corner and I can see the cornerstone. So good pastor, teacher, evangelist church, good evangelical, charismatic, you know. Senior pastor is either a pastor or he's a teacher. The assistant is one or the other. And the youth evangelist is evangelist. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got the three. The youth bring it in to the pastor, yeah. teacher. It's a, it looks like a house. He said, what's missing? I said, I don't see any foundations in here. I see the cornerstone, I don't see the foundations of apostles and prophets. Mm -hmm. He said, then I want you to go to a master builder in your church and ask him what he would do if he found a house. And when he looked underneath it, the, the foundations were missing or were broken or were damaged. Ask the master builder what he would do. I said, okay. So I asked him in the church, I said, sir, found the house. Troubles when I looked at it, good roof, good walls, good materials. But when I looked underneath the thing, when I looked at the, the foundations are gone. He said, you haven't brought it yet, have you? I said, no, sir. I'm just looking. He okay. said, then don't buy it. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the value of that property is not the house, it's the land. So he said, what you can do, and, and I would never do it, but some, some cowboy builders would tell you, you could put big, big beams and joists under there, hydraulic ramps. You could try and lift that whole house up. He said, I, I would never recommend it. Some people say it's fine. It, the whole house will go out of kilter, the door frames, the windows. You'll never get it level again. It is an absolute nightmare, and sometimes they collapse. And if you don't lift it all at the same time, people get killed when those things collapse on top of them. Yeah. He said, what I suggest you do if you did buy it, the value of that house is not the, the, not the house. It's the property of the land. You should, if you buy it, you strip that house down, salvage what you can off it, and start again. And, and you've got to pour the foundations, and only then you can perhaps use some of the materials to build. The Lord said to me, have you learned anything from it? I said, I don't know how many ministries would be willing to pull down their threefold churches and start again. Yeah. And I know some of them would be trying to lift the whole thing up and try and put foundations in there, the prophetic and the apostolic, and I think it's pretty, a lot of people get crushed and killed in it. He said to me, what, what do you think we should do first? I said, well, the first thing I can see is that we must get back to our first love and intimacy with you, which is worshiping Christ, mm -hmm. the cornerstone. <laughs> Worship, intimacy, the house of David. Then he said the best thing to do is to find the apostles and prophets and actually get them to work together and lay the foundation of the church. He said, how do you think that's going to be? <laughs> I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> I said most prophets I've met are quite high maintenance and fairly broken, you know. Yes. Some of them with wings missing and feathers missing. These prophets said, have been beaten up the church. He said, you know why? I said, yeah, because they've been killed. They've been, they've yeah. been butchered, man. And of course, if it's an insecure apostle like a Saul, he will kill the prophets. Yeah. But if he's got a heart like David and is a heart of, he will honor the prophets like he honored Samuel. Samuel, the prophet, anointed both kings, but only one of them really had the heart after God because mm -hmm. pride had come into the other one. So he said, if you honor the prophets, you get a prophet's reward. He said, yeah, and what's happened in your life? I said, the prophets have had so much impact in my heart. I've honored them, I love them, and I think they have helped me so much. 
He said, yeah, that's right, there's prophets and prophetesses. The key to it is not singular. I've given apostles and prophets yes. to the house, to the same one church. Yes. He said, it's not one apostle and yes. one prophet. He said, it's apostles and prophets, because he said in the Corinthian church, when the prophet would prophesy, let two or three other prophets in the church check that out. Mm -hmm. And in the Jerusalem church in the book of Acts, they didn't have one apostle, they had 12. In fact, one had hung, there was 11, and then they, they appointed another one in the upper room, and there were 12 apostles in the same church. You know, and to identify the fivefold within the church, it's not that we take, you know, we, you know, we put on a badge, you're the <laughs> apostle, and you're the Same prophet, way. or you know, but it's by function. It's what they do. Well, the, the, it, it comes the, out of them. Well, the key is what happens because of our insecurity, we find our identity in what we're called rather than actually what God's called us to do. Yes. Which is to be humble and to be known by your name, Mike Ian. Yes. <laughs> then go running around going, oh, Apostle Peter, we'd like to talk to you. And I said, Peter, you know, Apostle James. No, it was James. John. So I think the relationship was that they understood Christ and called them apostles, not to be shy of the title and say, well, no, I'm not, because then you're denying what God's called you to be. You're not to be too high or too low. Now, you can be an apostle and still be a Timothy, a young and mature one. Yes. Just like you can be an immature evangelist or an immature teacher. The fact is you've got to grow in that. And because the body of Christ hasn't got a revelation of it, we've put teachers first. Everyone's got to go through the Bible school. We haven't understood it's actually through revelation. The apostles had an encounter in revelation of Jesus. Jesus puts the apostles first. Mm -hmm. But that's not in hierarchy to rule over the others. He said if they rule over others, they will keep the, foot, the other four from flying as high as they're supposed to be. You'll have a club hand. But if they actually allow them and encourage them to fly higher and, and group together in unity, which is unity and diversity, not uniformity, the school of the evangelists, the school of the prophets, then we will have commanded unity, commanded blessing, and we'll have the authority and power that's missing because the apostle is to undergird and serve and to basically see the fullness yes. of the Bible. His job is to maintain unity and diversity because each one of them will say, aren't you a prophet? You know, aren't you an evangelist? I saw it as an upside down pyramid. I don't agree with it. You don't? No. Why? Because what ends up happening is that when we go with an upside down pyramid, if the pyramid is a true pyramid, then it's all focused upon one. Okay, um, well, if it's not, a, I just saw the form of a pyramid. So, I mean, I, yeah. let me explain further. <coughs> the Lord has shown it to me as servant as people that led with a servant heart. That's different. That's the heart and character. That's not the structure. But that's what I was seeing. As a servant heart, as the people that led the church were at the bottom, lifting right. everyone else up into their... They, they weren't on top, trying to lure down, yeah. boss down. That's right. But they were coming under to launch everyone into their call on destiny. Dead right. But I believe that, that picture is a picture of the heart, intent, and character. That doesn't give us structure. Structure is the, build, the building. Yes. Which is the bigger the foundation of the building. It's not a pyramid. In other words, the larger the apostolic and prophetic team that you see build, that's the, big, that's the size of the house. And it's not a pyramid, it's a house. It's the house of the Lord. It's a living house. So that means the, the greater we see apostolic and prophetic foundations lay, the more apostles and prophets in the house, yes. the bigger the house. Because, and it's a house, it's not a pyramid. Because as, as, as we talked uh, the other day, some are over 50, yep. some are over 100. So if uh, are you captains of thousands, yes. hundreds, fifties, and tens? Yes. So to the level that they are, you're going to be an apostle to apostle of 10. Yes, and if, if you had... 10 people who are captains over 10, you could easily right. manage 50 people in your church. Dead right. So you can, you can have in a small town, a little bit tiny small town, you don't need an apostle over 1,000. He needs to be in New York. He could be an apostle in a small town, which has got 100 people, and he could be an apostle to 10. Yeah. And you can have an evangelist to 10, a pastor to 10, a prophet to 10, and very quickly that church could grow to, if you've got five of them, you could grow that to what? 50, captains of 10, five people could grow that church to 50. Yes. Mm -hmm. Captains of 10s. Right. But he's an apostle of 10. You go, what? Isn't that demeaning? No. Much is given, much is required. The fact that they're an apostle, God talked about that in the structure. In the Jerusalem church, they were captains of thousands. 
the, the first, the New Testament church in the book of Acts, they weren't just a bunch of people praying. That wasn't just an upper room prayer. That was actually leaders who'd walked with Christ for three and a half years. Jesus appointed the 12, one of them hung himself, and he had appointed another 70, 72. So we had 84 leaders that Jesus himself personally picked and appointed. Yes. Called by God, not by man, appointed by God. The gift given by God. And then by the end of three years of ministry, you'd think you'd have thousands of people following him. No, he had 120. So, so then the church... They get up, the Holy Spirit falls in unity, commands the blessing, fire and wind come, the oil of heaven falls, and Psalm 133, because we are commanded blessing the fivefolds in one place, bam comes the anointing, Peter gets up, no signs and wonders, miracles, preaches a simple gospel message, 3,000 people saved. And they go, well, hello, 3,000 people. Well, they've got 120 leaders. Mm -hmm. God's going, that's not enough. I'm going to give you another 5,000 men the next week. And then with wives and children, that church within two weeks was a 12,000 member church. It's pretty good growth. Right. Yeah. 12 apostles, captains of thousands. Yeah. And underneath that, they had levels of captains of hundreds because of tens. Because they were working together. Dead right. And, not, and, and there were unity and diversity, not uniformity. Yes. So the mystery of true unity, I go to many groups and say, we have unity. I said, Let, show, me, show me your people. And I just meet prophet, 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 prophet. And they go, we're in unity. I said, no, you're in uniformity. And they go along, they say, show me your team. Evangelist, 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 evangelist. All, I said, you're all evangelists. You've got uniformity. You don't have unity. Mm -hmm. I said, all of you want to be captain. And you want your team. I said, God's the captain of the church, not you. We're all players. That's a different thinking. Yeah. So I said, God's structure. He said, okay, there's the building. So the greater the revelation of apostles and prophets being the foundation, that's the size of the house. Then he said, that's the structure. Living stones fitted jointly together. He said, if they're missing, you're going to get a house that's basically, what, roof on the ground? Or you're going to have a, a, a frumming framed up, <laughs> wind blowing through it. Or you're going to have a whole bunch of boys standing out there on the cornerstone, preaching in their open air in their crusades. And where the heck are they going to get discipled, pastor, delivered, and brought to fullness? How can you, the evangelist, bring them to the fullness of Christ? I don't care how much you equip and train. You're only going to equip them and train as you as an evangelist. Yeah. I don't care how many open heavens you get and glory realms, and how many angels you see in your upper, upper rooms, glory realm, um, school of prophets. You know what you're going to end up with? A whole bunch of uh, prophets that are going to stay with you. You're going to lose the rest of them, and they're going to have to struggle around like lost sheep to try and find someone who could actually pass them, somebody who could teach them. And they'll go seek their own kind. Well, so because they go and seek their own kind. And then yes. when they don't find their own kind and don't settle into a teaching church or into a pastoral church or into a prophetic church, evangelistic church, they'll end up in the mercy ministry. So they'll, they'll all rove around like a seething mass of lost sheep trying to find where on earth to go. And I said, God, what's the problem? He said, the problem's not with the sheep. It's to do with the shepherds, the ones that have called to build the church. They won't work together. The problem's with the leadership. Mm -hmm. And he said, the new wine comes into these structures, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And because the structures are wrong, the wine skin, it tears the structures to bits. So then they blame the Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, I mean, we've all seen churches split when the move of God comes. That's right. And I said, why is it? He said, because of the prophets who are bringing the fire down and bringing the raw presence, the anointing, holiness, and the truth, and the fear of the Lord. When they come in, if that church doesn't have an apostle running it, there's no way that that, that, that prophet, it'll blow that pastor teacher church to pieces. Yeah. Just rip it to bits. Because they can't handle the new wine. Because the wine skin can't handle it. It will split. They go, oh, this anointing is just scaring us. The living daylights. But an apostle go, hey, no, it ain't. A prophet will go, no, I want that. Yes. I want open heaven. I want the glory around. I want the fear of the Lord. I want the fire of God. I said, okay, if that's the structure is out of culture, what's the body? He said, here's another clear picture of why it all has to be one body, one church. And he said in the feet in First Corinthians um, chapter 12, it said, then we have the eye can't do without the hand, the foot can't do without it. And he, and he said to me, this is talking about a body. Okay? And, and then he goes, I said, then what does the body look like right now? Instantly, I saw an autopsy table. I saw a carved up body. I saw the heart out of its rib cage, pumping away, it was still alive. I said, what's that? He said, the heart represents the father heart, the pastor. I then saw a set of eyes sitting there, 
going, can't you see the angels? Can't you see heaven? And I said, what's that? He said, that's the prophet, the seers. Then I had the brain out of its skull sitting there. These are alive. The eyes were alive. The brain was alive. And um, he said, that's the mind. That's the teacher. Then I saw running around the table, feet, completely cut off from the rest of the body, feet. He said, how blessed are the feet of the good news. That's the evangelist. Yeah. I said, God, how come each one of them is still alive? He said, Ian, because I work all things for good for those who love me. I have resurrection power. Even though they're not connected to each other, even though they aren't even joined to get each other, even though they're not a body, even though they're only parts of the body, I will keep them alive because they love me. Yeah. I went, oh my gosh. So when you look at the church, you're seeing the teachers, the mind. You're seeing the evangelists running around doing their crusades. You're seeing the prophets seeing opening up the heavens. Yeah. And you're seeing the heart of the Father heart ministering to the broken heart, healing of the pastors, ministering to all the broken people off the cliff. He said, but all of them, the fivefold, are separated. That makes sense. Yeah. And so when I spoke to the Corinth church, he said, you cannot do it without each other. And then he said, the danger is in the Corinth church, when you take it first as apostle, second prophets, then we get hierarchy. Great danger in misunderstanding the apostolic and the fivefold is putting the apostle first. Yes. And then I've heard them say, well, then only the prophet and the apostle are heavenly minded. Everyone else is earthly minded. Well, that's a complete abomination because the fact is Jesus is himself seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. The teachers of the past, the evangelists, all come out of him. And I've met teachers who are actually speaking from revelation straight from the throne room. So don't tell me they haven't heard it from heaven. Yeah. I've got people who've got the Father heart of God that are ministering to James Jordans of this world who have got, they, 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 they're, they're pastors, pastors. I mean, they are, they are more of the love of God than anyone I've ever met together. Don't tell me they haven't been in the throne room. And I've met evangelists who weep over the multitude of compassion, yes. And out of great compassion comes straight from the heart of the Father. Reinhard Bunke says, yes. they have, don't tell me that they're not heavenly minded. Yes. So if we dishonor them, we then start moving into a hierarchical position where the apostles is the, is the top of the pile. We get a pyramid structure. Yeah. We demean the other fivefold. Then we demean the fact that Christ, who is the fullness of that, is actually saying that he's putting a hierarchy within the fivefold. He's not. He's the head of the church. Holy Spirit is, so he's the captain, Holy Spirit's the vice captain, and the fivefold are all players. And that'll level the playing field somewhat. You're all part of his team, yeah. not part of your team, because what we end up happening is the apostle wants to be the new captain. Now everyone I meet who's a prophet wants to be an apostle, because that's the new kid on the block. <laughs> it is just unbelievable how insecure people are, because their identity is not in Christ alone, it's in what they do for him. Yeah. And Jesus so, is saying, come back to me, get this thing right. So uh, let's bring this home and attempt to bring it to a landing. Let's just review <laughs> let's let's just review the points that we talked about. First of all, we feel strongly that the full five fold, including apostles and prophets, should be part of the local church. Definitely. And that the local church can handle it. The apostle, one apostle is not the guy who you anoint to be what was used to be called the pastor. Is that they're apostles prophets and that the fivefold is more of a team which, well, it is a which team. we didn't get into too much yet no here's the team yeah god's jesus the captain holy spirit vice captain we're all team players if anyone tries to become captain you're in danger yet of all the fivefold christ has called the apostle first so he has the ability to either serve or to lord yeah that's why i saw the upside down pyramid to serve yeah. So, and what we're doing in our church and what you're doing in yours is we're walking us out to see, okay, how do we work together? Walking into walls, not knowing because we've never been this way before, no one yes. to show us. It is very difficult because there's all the pulling away. So what I used to find when we ran church, church and I've been involved in different kind of churches, we would bring in, because the firefall's not in the church, we would hire, and God called them hirelings to me, he said they're hirelings, we would hire in the evangelist. So he had come in because we didn't have a mature evangelist in our church, so he was to come in to do the work of the evangelism and to equip and train. What ended up happening, he'd come in, or do the work, or he, she would come in, minister, people get saved, and then they were then, and trying to equip and train as best they could. And then what would happen, they'll leave a few pamphlets, come to my school of evangelism. Next minute, the magnet went over the church, 
Um, and next week we would have, as leaders, five applications from our church members saying, Oh, Pastor, I've never felt so touched in all my life. I just know that I know I have to go to that school of evangelism. Yeah. <laughs> go on. And the pastor's sitting there going, Oh my God, there goes three of my youth leaders. <laughs> and I don't, I don't trust these guys anymore. No, well, they go, I can't be holding, I can't be controlling, I don't want to. So they, they release them, but then they never see them again. Because yeah. then they go on to reproducing schools of evangelism and doing evangelistic crusades and leading thousands of the Lord and none of them come to church. But 98% the teachers will tell you 98% of all that never gets into the church. But we don't know how to get the zeal ba balanced with wisdom into that poor kid who's just been touched by a real evangelist because they are evangelists and they've been <laughs> activated. And we're in a great quandary how best to operate with that. Not controlling, being hard of releasing, not trying to manipulate, but trying to say how do we maintain the fullness of this in the local church. Then we bring a prophet in. Archie said, never bring a prophet in. Prophet comes in, Shabbat, Sikiyah, all the other prophets just start going, <laughs> flying, <laughs> visions, dreams. And next minute, the next week, I want to go off to that mountain where the school of the prophets are. Man, I'm yeah. just, why, why fly at this level when I can fly at that level? And so the greatest danger, I think, to the fivefold being formed in the new wineskin in a local church is not the, not the bad, but the better. In other words, they are attracted off to the school of the prophets, school of evangelists, school yeah. of the teachers. They are actually pulling the body of, body of Christ apart. The hardest thing is to actually hold maturity of apostles, prophets, pastors in a local church so that they don't have to move outside the house and you don't have to hire and hire these. You actually raise up within the house all of those. Yeah. And that's what we're working on. That is the mystery. That's the challenge. And I found the hardest people to come into the fivefold are ones who already have established ministries and will not lay yes. them down and will not come in and say, oh, I'm coming to the new wineskin. The greatest threat I find is that they're so comfortable with their own peers, with their own people, birds for the flock and together, uniformity. It's a very big challenge because they've either been hurt or damaged by pastors or by apostles or other people that are in the fivefold. They're frightened to come in and submit their ministry, which they've fought for, back to the Lord. But the trouble is we've been given, I've been given this promise, don't you dare tell me to lay it down. I said, well, Abraham, the father of faith, was given the promise of a son. And what did he do? He was asked by God to kill it. One of the greatest tests I've found is when a person has been given a ministry, they've fought for it, they've labored for it, then the biggest test of faith is to be willing to actually kill it so their identity is not on the promise. Yeah. So an attempt to bring us home again. <laughs> um, it's an experiment. I am, I am, after 32 years of ministry, I would not be doing anything else but attempting to lay the fivefold into the church right now. And I've realized that the first thing we've got to do is give back to intimacy and worship of Jesus Christ. So that means we must put worship as the head of the church. We are to build the house where we worship God. The danger is that if that's all we do and they bring that type of David Tabernacle, David Worship into the fivefold, and it is fundamentally part, and we just do it outside the church, we do more damage to the church again. Because we then we just have, oh, we are worshipping like David. Yeah. We're just musicians worshipping God. We are people who love the presence, but we are not willing to be part of the house. Yeah. It's lip service. Independence. Well, these are exciting days. It's uh, what an honor to be able to do this, to be able to search out this mystery. And uh, Ian, God bless you. Thank you for being here this week. Love you so much. Well, I pray that every local church would grab the revelation of fivefold, and I believe that in every local church they're most likely there. There are different levels of maturity, but our job is to one recognize each other and allow each other to fly. Yeah. And we've got to give space for that to happen in our local church. I feel that most of the local churches have the fivefold already in there, and we must then work on how do we then see that birthed and, and fostered in the in the home church. The biggest danger of that is that they're going to be drawn away by the independence of the individual firefold that run their own mm -hmm. ministries that are this high. Yeah. And that, I think, is the greatest danger that we have. And I do not believe in territorial apostles. I believe it's all relational. And I believe that we are not to have an apostle over regions. The, each local church can have its own. Yes, no. absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for watching, and God bless you. Amen.